Bob and Penny were sharing at table what an extraordinary group you are. And I haven't been on a lot of pilgrimages, but I must say that this is a great group. It's a joy being with all of you all and gradually getting to meet you. And we would mingle more, but our, our meals are preparing for what's coming next. So that's why we eat together, is just to kind of get our act together at each meal for what's coming up. But <laughs> so it, it would be a joy to get to meet you more that way, but right now, because of just keeping things together, we haven't been doing that. But it is a joy to be with you. At lunch today, we were talking, our team and one of the priests, about some of the real problems that many of you have been facing in the church today. And when I was living for 18 months, 20 days a month at EWTN, I'd meet people from around the country and get phone calls from around the country, just of so many people whose hearts were broken with what was going on in their parish church or neighboring parishes and so on. And that can get to be depressing. So I thought I would talk for my sake, first of all, and then for yours, on the signs of the times. We are very familiar with a lot of the problems, both in our culture and in our church, of the real problems, which are part of the signs of the times. But there are also many wonderful signs of the times. Can you all hear me OK in the back? OK. Put up your hand if I get too low. I think so often of Charles Dickens and A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And I think that of our times. And I think of the church, or say, maybe, I guess the church is a, a shore. And you can stand on a shore, and waves are always coming in. But sometimes the tide is going out, and so the tide is receding even though waves are coming in. Other times the tide is coming in as the waves come in. And it seems that in the history of the church, there have been high tides and low tides. And I personally feel that the tide is coming in today, that in the midst of many problems which we're going through, that wave after wave of renewal, wave after wave of the Holy Spirit is washing on the shore of our church. I believe we're living in a privileged time. And I'm not going to elaborate on all the signs. I'm going to enumerate the signs and speak especially on the heart of Jesus as a sign of salvation. But as I've already mentioned before, I believe that we're seeing the beginning of the Eucharistic reign of the heart of Jesus, or the reign of the Eucharistic heart of Jesus, as chapels of Eucharistic adoration spring up around the country and around the world, led by the Holy Father, who has it around the clock in St. Peter's. There are religious nuns, sisters, praying around the clock when the church is closed. I look on the Marian renewal today, as a great wave of renewal in the church today. And it seems to me that much of it was sparked by Medjugorje. We await the final judgment of the church on Medjugorje. But it just seems that so many pilgrims from around the world have gone there and brought back the gospel message of turning back to Jesus from there. And so that there's a real renewal of Marian devotion today. I look on the charismatic renewal as an extraordinary wave of renewal in the church today. I know personally after the sacraments and after my vocation as a Jesuit, I feel the greatest single grace I have received in my life is what we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit in the charismatic renewal. It changed my life. It really did. And I thank God and I praise God for that grace. Um, I think the Holy Father himself is a sign of the times. I think John Paul II is an extraordinary sign of the times, this strong, courageous man who, come what may, preaches the truth. And it, he's not intimidated. He wasn't intimidated by the Nazis growing up. He wasn't intimidated by the communists as a bishop and a cardinal in Poland. And he ain't intimidated now. <laughs> he, keeps, <laughs> he keeps going strong. I, I think of Mother Teresa as another symbol of a wave of renewal. She herself is an extraordinary charismatic person. I mean, I'm not using charismatic in the sense of belonging to a movement, but just of a person gifted by the Holy Spirit. And she stands to me as a symbol of all those who are working for life and all of those who are working for the poor. 
and a real call to us in the church to wake up to, for this sleeping giant of the church to wake up and start praying and moving and acting for life and really reaching out in concern for the poor. And she, speaking years ago when she received the Nobel Peace Prize and speaking about pro-life and telling them that you can't have peace in the world as long as mothers are killing their own children, and then speaking to that interdenominational prayer breakfast in Washington recently, where she spoke to the president and his wife, the vice president and his wife, and spoke the truth, and part that you don't even read in the media, she not only spoke about um, against abortion, she spoke against artificial contraception to that group, showing the connection. She got a standing ovation from all but four. <laughs> <laughs> but she's willing to tell it like it is. And she's a prophetic voice in the church and in the world today. And just parenthetically, now our president has heard a prophetic word three times, personally, from the Pope in Denver, from Mother Teresa in Washington, and more recently when he visited the Pope in Rome. Am I going to? I'm going over the edge. Don't go over the edge. Another extraordinary thing today is the wave of evangelization in the church today. You know, Mother Angelica's network, EWTN, the work of Bob and Penny Lord, and. I really believe that the fact that I'm in evangelization is due to the gift of the baptism of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit pushes you. As my good friend Al Mansfield says, Jesus said two words in the gospel. One was come, and the other was go. <laughs> and, and so there is a wave of evangelization today. I want to speak especially about the wave of divine mercy. And the Holy Father, when he beatified Blessed Faustina on Mercy of God Sunday, still unofficial, April the 18th, 1993, last year. In his homily, he said, the marvelous spread of Sister Faustina's devotion to the merciful Jesus is a sign of the times, a sign of the 20th century. So when the Pope himself looks at something and calls it publicly a sign of the times, we need to take notice. And so we are, I feel, so privileged to be bathed with all of these waves of the Holy Spirit. And as I said once before in this group, I, I think I've said it, I look upon the Marian movement and the charismatic renewal as they come together to be a great tidal wave. As I said, Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit and we have not heard of, of a divorce. And <laughs> as soon as those movements get more and more together, as Marian's open up more fully to the Holy Spirit and his charismatics open up more fully to Mary, we're going to see a huge amount of the energy of the Spirit for renewal released. But I want to speak about the wave of divine mercy, but I want to go back to Margaret Mary because I feel very much Blessed Faustina is a modern Saint Margaret Mary. Jesus revealed his heart to both of them and he put more of an accent on reparation with Margaret Mary a huge accent on mercy with Blessed Faustina, but it's one stream. It's not like these, in my mind, are two different devotions. It's just an ongoing completion of what was started. And it wasn't started with Blessed Faustina. It started on the cross, it started with the life of Jesus, with the incarnation. All of this was God's mercy. This devotion is rooted in scripture. But Margaret Mary was the one through whom the Lord popularized devotion to his sacred heart. And it's interesting to me that her first apparition occurred on the feast of John the Apostle, John who rested on the heart of Jesus at the Last Supper. And the Lord appeared to her on that feast in, 19, in 1673, and he took her heart, plunged like a little atom, she said, plunged it into his heart, and then gave it back to her all on fire with love. Wouldn't that be wonderful for him to do that to us? Like, take our heart, put them in yours, and give them back to us, fully on fire with your love. She had um, another apparition in um, the next year, she had, in which she saw the five wounds of Jesus as five suns, just radiating brilliantly. And 
the wound in the heart as the most brilliant of all. Have any of you been to the chapel in Pare La Monial? A few of you. That's the, that's the mural that's over the altar of the chapel of the visitation nuns there. The five sons coming from the five wounds of Jesus, but especially from the wound in his heart. Then the great apparition, as it's called, was in 19... In 1675, the first one she was praying before the Blessed Sacrament. I'm not sure if she was at the second one, but this third great one. As I prayed before the Blessed Sacrament, one day during the octave of Corpus Christi, and so that was somewhere between June the 13th and June the 20th in 1675, I received from my God excessive tokens of love and felt myself delirious to make some return and render to him love for love. He said to me, you cannot do me anything better than by doing what I've so often asked of you. Then revealing his divine heart, he said, and this is the, these are the words I think most of us have heard and read many times. Behold this heart, which has loved men so much that it has spared nothing even to exhausting and consuming itself in order to give them proof of its love. And in return, I receive from the greater number nothing but ingratitude, contempt, irreverence, sacrilege, and coldness in this sacrament of my love. And that might describe the church today, too. You know, since so few people go to confession anymore, and so many people go to communion, one wonders, you know. Therefore, I ask of you that the first Friday after the active of the Blessed Sacrament shall be kept as a special feast in honor of my heart. Jesus asked for a feast of the Sacred Heart. It took about a hundred years or so before it actually became a liturgical feast. Blessed Faustina was asked by the Lord for a feast of mercy to be the Sunday after Easter. And this is moving perhaps faster. The Holy Father, when he beatified her, beatified her on the Sunday after Easter. So although he hadn't declared it yet as a feast of mercy, he seems to be making a a step in that direction. <clears throat> so be kept as a special feast in honor of my heart to make re reparation for all the indignities offered to it and as a communion day in order to atone for the unworthy treatment it has received when exposed on my altars. I also promise that my heart shall shed in abundance the influence of its divine love on all those who shall honor it or cause it to be honored. And we're all familiar with the promises of the Sacred Heart. And I'm sure most of us grew up going to communion on First Fridays. How many of you were trained in that, to go to communion on First Fridays? Most of us, the, the younger ones among you, may not have had that training because a lot of that has kind of fallen into disuse. But it was such a wonderful thing, and I hope that it gets revived, the First Fridays and the First Saturdays today. Now, in the 19... 30s, Jesus began appearing to this simple Polish nun, Sister Helen. Her real name was Helen, and I don't pronounce the Polish correctly, but I'm going to give you my version of it, Kowalska. And she had had only a third grade education, and not fully three years, but a few months in the course of her early days. She'd had that much education. Consequently, she wrote with many misspellings, with many grammatical errors, and so on, with poor punctuation which caused problems later on, I think, when Rome rejected or banned this devotion for a while. But she entered the convent, and Jesus began to give her a message and devotions to divine mercy. Most people, I think, focus more on the devotions than on the message. The devotions are means of responding to the message, but the main thing is the message, and it's just God's mercy is above all his works that God's mercy is incomprehensible to men and angels. It's beyond anything we can imagine. And I think of the scripture passage where God is telling how merciful he is, and then this is in Isaiah 55. He says, my thoughts are above your thoughts, and my ways are above your ways. As high as the heavens are above your ways, so are my thoughts above your thoughts, and my ways above your ways. That was in the context of talking about his mercy. God's mercy is beyond anything that we can know. We tend to reach a point beyond which we won't go farther. But God didn't like that. As I heard it put once, 
Oh, Jesus told her, I didn't give you a limited number of forgiveness. It's like the beginning of life. He didn't give us a roll of 100 tickets and say, okay, you got 100 <laughs> chances and that's it. Thank God. Thank God. It's it'll, unlimited. It's unlimited. And we see this in the institution of the sacrament of, of the reconciliation. Jesus appeared to his apostles on Easter Sunday night. And as I've said many times, if I had been Jesus, and I thank God I wasn't and I'm not, I would have said to the apostles, okay, I forgive you guys, but I'm getting a whole new batch to be my apostles. You all chickened out <laughs> on me in the cross. And Peter, the rock, you crumbled. You know? But St. Paul says the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. He doesn't take them back. And so Jesus breathes on them. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Jesus sent these men who had chickened out on him, one who had denied him, and uses them to go out to bring his message. And then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. So Jesus makes these poor sinful men the instruments of his mercy. And he continues doing that throughout history. He uses your fellow weak human beings to be instruments of his mercy. So that when you go to confession, it's one sinner going to another sinner. Unless you go to somebody who's never sinned. <laughs> I don't know any such a person. One sinner going to another. He uses sinful men to bring his mercy to others. And the way I got involved in this was through my, father, my good friend, Father George Kosicki. You may have seen that series we did with the kitchen set. It was actually a real kitchen where we discussed these devotions. And Father George used to run houses of prayer for priests. And he and I have been good buddies since about 1970, 71. And I went to a number of them. And at one of them, he had Father Seraphim Michalenko, who is the co-author of this little booklet. If any of you do not have this, I would be delighted to send you one. Uh, are we going to send out a, a, do we have a list, a computerized list of all the names and addresses of everybody on the tour? Would we get that? If not, I want you to get my address because I'd be happy to send you one of these booklets. But anyway, I heard Father Seraphim speak about this and I was so delighted to hear. I just realized how much I needed mercy and in turn wanted to be an instrument of mercy. And so this has really become, I guess, the primary thrust of my own life is to spread the message of God's mercy and the revelations of his mercy. Sister Faustina, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, but I like to say it again. This picture is a beautiful picture, but it doesn't reflect her as she was known by the people who knew her. They said she was very cheerful, laughed a lot, the girls she worked with prostitutes, the girls she worked with loved her, loved to be around her, except she got them to pray the rosary too much. I might have told you that. She'd get revelations The one Father Seraphim told me about. She was working in the garden with them, and this would be typical. She got the revelation, somebody's trying to commit suicide now, let's pray the rosary. So other than that, the girls loved her, but she got them to pray the rosary too much. <laughs> the nuns said they saw her cheerful and laughing. The only time they saw her serious was in the chapel at night, and sometimes they'd even see her weeping there. One nun was asked, who knew her, was she a saint? And she said, how could she be a saint? She had red hair and freckles. <laughs> but that made her a lot more human to me than this picture did. And so I, I just feel a new bond with her. I call her freckles at times. <laughs> and, and I like to say the Latin word for hurry up is festina. So I like to say Festina Faustina when you want, <laughs> want something. <laughs> you can remember that, Festina Faustina. So the Lord gave her the great message of mercy. I want to give you just a sample. This is a new little book that Father Kosicki wrote. It's just excerpts from the diary. And this is a page that I, page I just love, a passage I love. Write, my daughter, that I am mercy itself for the contrite soul. A soul's greatest wretchedness does not enkindle me with wrath, but rather my heart is moved toward it with great mercy. You know, we feel our misery and we feel our, our, our wretchedness. And Jesus told her one time, said, you are misery itself, but I pour mercy on you. One time she had...
Put it in my pocket because it caused a problem the other time. While we're breaking, let's stand up a minute. Take a breath. We won't sing yet. We'll save that till you get sleepier. But right now, just take a couple of good breaths. Let's do the, what is it, what is it, what is it? Second line. The second line. <laughs> a few good stretches. A few good stretches. Okay. Okay. I got it.